Part two, chapter ten Filibusters A Fatal Morning Section one A The adventure that befell us on the way was also a surprising one, but I must tell the story in due order. An hour before Stepan Trofimovitch and I came out into the street, a crowd of people, the hands from Spiegelin's factory, seventy or more in number, had been marching through the town and had been an object of curiosity to many spectators. They walked intentionally, in good order, and almost in silence. Afterwards it was asserted that these seventy had been elected out of the whole number of factory hands, amounting to about nine hundred, to go to the governor and to try and get from him, in the absence of their employer, a just settlement of their grievances against the manager, who, in closing the factory and dismissing the workmen, had cheated them all in an impudent way, a fact which has since been proved conclusively. Some people still deny that there was any election of delegates, maintaining that seventy was too large a number to elect, and that the crowd simply consisted of those who had been most unfairly treated, and that they only came to ask for help in their own case, so that the general mutiny of the factory workers, about which there was such an uproar later on, had never existed at all. Others fiercely maintained that these seventy men were not simple strikers, but revolutionists, that is, not merely that they were the most turbulent, but that they must have been worked upon by seditious manifestos. The fact is, it is still uncertain whether there had been any outside influence or incitement at work or not. My private opinion is that the workmen had not read the seditious manifestos at all, and if they had read them would not have understood one word, for one reason because the authors of such literature write very obscurely in spite of the boldness of their style. But as the workmen really were in a difficult plight, and the police to whom they appealed would not enter into their grievances, what could be more natural than their idea of going in a body to the general himself, if possible, with a petition at their head, forming up in an orderly way before his door, and as soon as he showed himself, all falling on their knees and crying out to him as to providence itself? To my mind, there's no need to see in this a mutiny or even a deputation for it's a traditional, historical mode of action. The Russian people have always loved to parley with the general himself for the mere satisfaction of doing so, regardless of how the conversation may end. And so I am quite convinced that, even though Pyotr Stepanovitch, Liputin, and perhaps some others, perhaps even Fedka too, had been flitting about among the workpeople talking to them, and there is fairly good evidence of this, they had only approached two, three, five at the most, trying to sound them, and nothing had come of their conversation. As for the mutiny they advocated, if the factory workers did understand anything of their propaganda, they would have left off listening to it at once as to something stupid that had nothing to do with them. Fedka was a different matter. He had more success, I believe, than Pyotr Stepanovitch. Two workmen are now known for a fact to have assisted Fedka in causing the fire in the town which occurred three days afterwards, and a month later three men who had worked in the factory were arrested for robbery and arson in the province. But if in these cases Fedka did lure them to direct an immediate action, he could only have succeeded with these five, for we have heard of nothing of the sort being done by others. Be that as it may, the whole crowd of workpeople had at last reached the open space in front of the governor's house and were drawn up there in silence and good order. Then, gaping open-mouthed at the front door, they waited. I am told that as soon as they halted, they took off their caps, that is, a good half hour before the appearance of the governor, who, as ill luck would have it, was not at home at the moment. The police made their appearance at once at first individual policemen, and then as large a contingent of them as could be gathered together. They began, of course, by being menacing, ordering them to break up. But the workmen remained obstinately like a flock of sheep at a fence, and replied laconically that they had come to see the general himself. It was evident that they were firmly determined. The unnatural shouting of the police ceased and was quickly succeeded by deliberations, mysterious whispered instructions, and stern fussy perplexity, which wrinkled the brows of the police officers. The head of the police preferred to await the arrival of the governor himself. It was not true that he galloped to the spot with three horses at full speed and began hitting out right and left before he alighted from his carriage. 
it's true that he used to dash about and was fond of dashing about at full speed in a carriage with a yellow back and while his trace horses who were so trained to carry their heads that they looked positively perverted galloped more and more frantically rousing the enthusiasm of all the shopkeepers in the bazaar he would rise up in the carriage stand erect holding on by a strap which had been fixed on purpose at the side and with his right arm extended into space like a figure on a monument survey the town majestically but in the present case he did not use his fists and though as he got out of the carriage he could not refrain from a forcible expression this was simply done to keep up his popularity there is a still more absurd story that soldiers were brought up with bayonets and that a telegram was sent for artillery and cossacks those are legends which are not believed now even by those who invented them it's an absurd story too that barrels of water were brought from the fire brigade and that people were drenched with water from them the simple fact is that ilya ilyitch shouted in his heat that he wouldn't let one of them come dry out of the water probably this was the foundation of the barrel legend which got into the columns of the petersburg and moscow newspapers probably the most accurate version was that at first all the available police formed a cordon round the crowd and a messenger was sent for lemka a police superintendent who dashed off in the carriage belonging to the head of the police on the way to skvoreshniki knowing that lemka had gone there in his carriage half an hour before but i must confess that i am still unable to answer the question how they could at first sight from the first moment have transformed an insignificant that is to say an ordinary crowd of petitioners even though there were several of them into a rebellion which threatened to shake the foundations of the state why did lemka himself rush at that idea when he arrived twenty minutes after the messenger i imagine but again it's only my private opinion that it was to the interest of ilya ilyitch who was a crony of the factory managers to represent the crowd in this light to lemka in order to prevent him from going into the case and lemka himself had put the idea into his head in the course of the last two days he had had two unusual and mysterious conversations with him it is true they were exceedingly obscure but ilya ilyitch was able to gather from them that the governor had thoroughly made up his mind that there were political manifestos and that spigulin's factory hands were being incited to a socialist rising and that he was so persuaded of it that he would perhaps have regretted it if the story had turned out to be nonsense he wants to get distinction in petersburg our wily ilya ilyitch thought to himself as he left von lemke well that just suits me but i am convinced that poor andrey antonovitch would not have desired a rebellion even for the sake of distinguishing himself he was a most conscientious official who had lived in a state of innocence up to the time of his marriage and was it his fault that instead of an innocent allowance of wood from the government and an equally innocent minchen a princess of forty summers had raised him to her level i know almost for certain that the unmistakable symptoms of the mental condition which brought poor andrey antonovitch to a well-known establishment in switzerland where i am told he is now regaining his energies were first apparent on that fatal morning but once we admit that unmistakable signs of something were visible that morning it may well be allowed that similar symptoms may have been evident the day before though not so clearly i happen to know from the most private sources well you may assume that yulia mikhailovna later on not in triumph but almost in remorse for a woman is incapable of complete remorse revealed part of it to me herself that andrey antonovitch had gone into his wife's room in the middle of the previous night past two o'clock in the morning had waked her up and had insisted on her listening to his ultimatum he demanded it so insistently that she was obliged to get up from her bed in indignation and curl papers and sitting down on a couch she had to listen though with sarcastic disdain only then she grasped for the first time how far gone her andrey antonovitch was and was secretly horrified she ought to have thought what she was about and have been softened but she concealed her horror and was more obstinate than ever like every wife she had her own method of treating andrey antonovitch which she had tried more than once already and with it driven him to frenzy yulia mikhailovna's method was that of contemptuous silence 
for one hour two a whole day and almost for three days and nights silence whatever happened whatever he said whatever he did even if he had clambered up to throw himself out of a three-story window a method unendurable for a sensitive man whether yulia mihailovna meant to punish her husband for his blunders of the last few days and the jealous envy he as the chief authority in the town felt for her administrative abilities whether she was indignant at his criticism of her behaviour with the young people and local society generally and lack of comprehension of her subtle and far-sighted political aims or was angry with his stupid and senseless jealousy of pyotr stepanovitch however that may have been she made up her mind not to be softened even now in spite of its being three o'clock at night and though andrey antonovitch was in a state of emotion such as she had never seen him in before pacing up and down in all directions over the rugs of her boudoir beside himself he poured out everything everything quite disconnectedly it's true but everything that had been rankling in his heart for it was outrageous he began by saying that he was a laughing-stock to everyone and was being led by the nose curse the expression he squealed at once catching her smile let it stand it's true no madam the time has come let me tell you it's not a time for laughter and feminine arts now we are not in the boudoir of a mincing lady but like two abstract creatures in a balloon who have met to speak the truth he was no doubt confused and could not find the right words for his ideas however just they were it is you madam you who have destroyed my happy past i took up this post simply for your sake for the sake of your ambition you smile sarcastically don't triumph don't be in a hurry let me tell you madam let me tell you that i should have been equal to this position and not only this position but a dozen positions like it for i have abilities but with you madam with you it's impossible for with you here i have no abilities there cannot be two centres and you have created two one of mine and one in your boudoir two centres of power madam but i won't allow it i won't allow it in the service as in marriage there must be one centre two are impossible how have you repaid me he went on our marriage has been nothing but your proving to me all the time every hour that i am a non-entity a fool and even a rascal and i have been all the time every hour forced in a degrading way to prove to you that i am not a non-entity not a fool at all and that i impress every one with my honourable character isn't that degrading for both sides at this point he began rapidly stamping with both feet on the carpet so that yulia mihailovna was obliged to get up with stern dignity he subsided quickly but passed to being pathetic and began sobbing yes sobbing beating himself on the breast almost for five minutes getting more and more frantic at yulia mihailovna's profound silence at last he made a fatal blunder and let slip that he was jealous of pyotr stepanovitch realizing that he had made an utter fool of himself he became savagely furious and shouted that he would not allow them to deny god and that he would send her salon of irresponsible infidels packing that the governor of a province was bound to believe in god and so his wife was too that he wouldn't put up with these young men that you madam for the sake of your own dignity ought to have thought of your husband and to have stood up for his intelligence even if he were a man of poor abilities and i'm by no means a man of poor abilities and yet it's your doing that every one here despises me it was you who put them all up to it he shouted that he would annihilate the woman question that he would eradicate every trace of it that tomorrow he would forbid and break up their silly fete for the benefit of the governesses damn them that the first governess he came across tomorrow morning he would drive out of the province with a cossack i'll make a point of it he shrieked do you know he screamed do you know that your rascals are inciting men at the factory and that i know it let me tell you i know the names of four of these rascals and that i am going out of my mind hopelessly hopelessly End of part two, chapter ten, section one a.